So um, that's where we kind of pick up in terms of our laboratory procedures, right? So if you look on the screen, step A was our tray and our impression. We make a mold of the tooth, essentially. From that point, what's our next step? Is to pour that impression into some sort of stone, right? Turn the impression into stone and then put on an instrument that simulates the movements of the mouth, which is what we call an articulator. We're going to get into that articulator a bit tomorrow. But we're going to run through the lab procedures and all the science behind it um, today. So I'll be honest, this is one of the more dry topics that we have in dentistry, dental materials. I know that because I taught it to you guys. And I saw your faces as I was teaching it. However, this lecture becomes a gold mine for good test questions, okay? Because it's all the stuff that you guys don't care about that you probably forget pretty easily, and it's easy things to test you on, okay? So not a whole lot that you can just kind of reason through, you know, principles or theories or concepts. This is just, you just got to know this stuff. You got to know the names, got to memorize certain things, okay? So yeah, we got some yawns already. <laughs> That's a great sign, guys. <laughs> Great side. All right, what types of stone is the cast made of? So thankfully, I taught you guys dental materials. So hopefully, there's some recollection of these things. I try to teach a class to set you up for this class so we can breeze through some of this stuff, right? All right, how, uh, how do we mount our cast? We're going to get that get into that tomorrow. What are the ways to best simulate the movements of the jaw? That's tomorrow. What are the different types of articulators? OK, so let's go back to that first question. What do we pour this stone in? We pour it into gypsum, right? We know powder plus liquid or powder plus water is going to give us stone plus heat. So if you want to distill that down further, specifically, hemihydrate plus water gives you some sort of dihydrate plus some of the unreacted hemihydrate plus heat. And if you want the chemical formulations, that's down at the bottom. I don't need you to memorize the chemical formulas, but the important part, I think, of the setting reaction is the understanding that this is a dissolution precipitation theory, okay? In other words, the way to think about it is as this reaction happens, you have crystals or um, nuclei that starts to crystallize and starts to um, propagate, and then you get a more firm kind of consistency as you go, right? It starts off watery. It starts to get a little bit kind of more fuller in body and kind of less viscous. And eventually it sets. So that's the idea is that these crystals are growing and solidifying this gypsum. So we have this idea, or sometimes you'll see some dentists or lab technicians, they'll take a little bit of slurry water. You guys know what slurry water is? So from the model trimmer, Right? You notice how there's water running through it to keep everything cool. Some of the water that runs off, right? there's a little hose that connects to the sink. If you take a little bit of water from that, you know, the used water, it's got little particles of stone. So if you use that water instead of water straight from the tap, what do you think is going to happen? The setting reactions incur faster. And why is that? Because it's got more sites of nucleation for this crystallization to occur, okay? So write that down. Slurry water accelerates the setting of gypsum because it has more sites of nucleation. We also learned, maybe this is alginate. Where you, some of us had used warm water. What happened to the alginate? Set real quick. Similar principle here. Warm water will probably ex it will accelerate the set of this Gypsum. So be careful when you're pouring up your casts, the temperature of the water, especially here in Arizona, because some of those pipes get real warm, right, in the summers, okay? And that'll cost you. That's why some of us had to repeat that alginate multiple, multiple times. So gypsum goes from type 1 to type 5. And we know that they're classified based on compressive strength. So look at the middle column. Type 1 has a compressive strength of 4 megapascals. When you get to type 4 and 5, you're going to have um, a compressive strength of 35 megapascals. So as you look at the terms on the left, 
don't worry so much about whether it's impression plaster or model plaster. Uh, because companies will name the type of stone based on its use. For example, you may have orthodontists, they may pour up their casts in a specific stone, we will call it orthostone, and, they'll, and it'll be actually a type 2 gypsum. Okay, so all those words don't necessarily always line up. Okay, but the idea is from 1 through 5, things get harder. Okay, in general, if you want to kind of categorize it, we can classify type 1 and type 2 stones as plaster. And whenever you hear plaster, you think plaster of Paris, right? And you think of something that's probably easy that, you know, it sets up, it gets hard, but it's easy to break off. Whereas your type 4 or 3, 4, and 5 stones are a little bit harder. So let's go over sort of the um, makeup of this stone and what makes it different. So your type 1 and 2 stones or gypsums are going to be classified as a hemihydrate or beta hemihydrate that's contrasted by your type 3 to 5 stones which they'll consider an alpha hemihydrate. So something you'll probably want to remember for your exam. And the beta hemihydrate has larger particles and they're irregularly shaped. So if you go back to the picture you can see the difference between the two shapes and if you carry this out and kind of think logically well the more irregularly shaped your particles are, the less that you can condense them. The less dense your stone in, the, your, the less dense your stone is, the less strength it probably has, right? Whereas your alpha or more orderly particles that are prism or rod shape that you can compact a little bit better, thus you're probably going to have stone that is a little bit stronger. Okay? Make sense? Yeah? Where are my nodders in the class? I always look to you guys to make sure you got somebody following along. Okay, so this is just a summary of type 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 stone. Um, again, plaster, plaster, don't stone. This is just other ways you can, people refer to them, but really type 1 through 5, just think of it as compressive strength. So real quickly, type 1, you're generally going to find that as um, a, a mounting plaster. That's what we use it for. So how to mount our cast onto the articulator. And sometimes, previously, they used to make impressions, complete denture impressions with this stuff, which is probably not a fun, because it kind of gets everywhere and it's real messy. But that's not used as much. Type 2, um, you're going to find this when they process dentures. You don't have to know that. That's for your next, uh, your complete denture course. Uh, but type 2 isn't used a whole lot in our clinic here. Type 3 is going to be used pretty commonly Whenever you make your diagnostic impressions on your patients, so in their first patient exam that they come in and you do all your hard tissue, soft tissue findings, you're also going to get alginate impressions of their upper and lower, and you're going to pour that up into type 3 stone. So that we use that just for a diagnostic purposes. You're also going to pour all your complete denture impressions in this type 3 micro stone. So the reason for that is type 3 is a little softer than what we use for your crown and bridge stuff. And we want a softer stone because eventually we're going to break that cast when we recover the denture. So again, this is probably a little bit above what you need to know. You're going to learn all that in your complete denture class. But just make a mental note. The key here is complete denture impressions should be poured in type 3 dental stone. So if there's one thing I'll test you on, it's going to be on that, okay? Um, type 4 and 5, this is what we typically use for our crown and bridge stuff. And that's because it's harder. So why is it beneficial to use the hardest stone that we have? So think about the process of making this crown, right? How many times are we taking something off the die or checking the contacts, let's say? So you want a stone that is going to resist abrasion, or it's not going to wear very much. Right? So imagine you're taking this metal crown and you're putting it on and off all the time, or in the wax-up stage you're taking it on and off. It's very easy to, you know, very gently abrade the stone. So you want to use the hardest stone that we have. So now we have a difference between a type 4 and a type 5. So let's go back to this chart, and we're going to see that they have the same compressive strength. 
But what do you notice is different about them? Well, one's labeled a high expansion. The other is labeled a low expansion. So type 4 is low expansion. Type 5 is high expansion, but they have the same compressive strength. So the question is, well, when would you rather use a low expansion and when would you rather use a high expansion? So let's go back to this first slide real quick. So let's think about all these steps that we have, right? So we have our tooth that we start off with, and then we have our impression material. What happens to the impression material dimensionally as it sets? It's more rigid, but dimensionally in terms of size, does it shrink or expand? Shrink or expand? Shrink. So just think of anything that polymerizes, right? We think about that polymerization reaction. What happens to polymers? They link up. So you have a bunch of loose monomers, let's say, and they all start to link up and form more orderly, you know, orderly chain. So that's like having a bunch of you guys just spread out a bunch, you know, throughout the room, and all of a sudden we say, line up and then fit in that corner, right? We can pack you guys in pretty compactly if we're in an orderly form, okay? So anything that polymerizes will go from a bunch of loose strands, they polymerize and you have some sort of shrinkage. So impression material shrinks. How about stone? When you pour dental stone, what happens there? It expands, right? And if you look back at that chart, you're going to have some expansion percentages. So that it's always going to, as, think about the crystals as they form, they're going to push against each other, and they're going to expand. Okay, so we have impression material that shrinks, stone that expands, then you put wax on there. So as wax cools, what happens there? It shrinks a bit. Okay, then you pour investment material around the wax. What happens to investment material? Shrinks or expands? Expands. Okay, then you have casting, the metal. So as you heat the metal, what happens when you just heat things in general? Do they expand or do they shrink? They expand. And when they cool, they shrink. Okay? So what we're going to learn is, so this is all to get to this point, right? All these materials that we have have little dimensional changes to them. And our job as Dennis and also to work with the lab technician is to figure out the materials that we're using and have them all coordinate together so that the little differences in expansion and shrinking will all more or less equal out so that when we recover our casting, our casting, the gold crown, and put it onto the patient's tooth, it's going to fit. Because if any one of these steps goes haywire, or if you don't do your, you know, uh, calculations, you don't really calculate anything, but, um, you know, you, you get the idea that if one of these things are way off, then you may get a restoration that's not going to fit the mouth. So generally what happens is, you know, these materials have certain specifications to them. So your stone is going to reproduce to a certain level of detail. Your impression material is going to be rated to uh, capture a certain amount of detail. And same with our stone and our investment material. Okay? So the idea is that now when we have a type 4 and 5 stone, well, we have options now. So if we know we're using a metal that's going to shrink more, well, in order to compensate for that, we can use a higher expansion gypsum to balance that out. Whereas if you use a metal that doesn't shrink as much, well, you can probably get away with a type 4 stone, which is low expansion. Okay? So it's just another tool that we have to be able to compensate for the differences in material that we may be using. Okay? You see at least two people to nod here. Okay. So that's why we have a type 4 and 5 with varying levels of expansion is to compensate for the different types of metal that, we're that we may be using. Some metals shrink more than others, and we'll get into that in a bit. Okay. So uh, water powder ratio is important for our gypsum. So type 1, you're going to need more water. Your type 5, you're going to need less. So you think of that as, okay, things are more orderly, right? Your uh, type 5, things can be compacted a little bit more. 
you don't need as much water in between those particles, whereas large, irregularly shaped particles, you're going to need more water um, per powder. So we know that, and you can remember that, because our mounting plaster that you guys used when you guys mounted your cast for um, uh, your dental, your occlusion class, or dental anatomy class, right? That little white stuff that we mixed up, looked like cocaine, right? We used 63 milliliters of water, whereas the microstone that we mixed for your project earlier in this course, we used only 40 milliliters of water. So microstone, the yellow stuff, is type 3 stone, or type 3 gypsum. Our mounting plaster is a type 1. And then our dye stone that we're going to use to pour up your final impressions, we want that to be a dye type 4. So there's some slides that tell us that kind of going forward. Okay? So water powder ratio is important to maintain and keep exact. So I see a lot of students, they get down in the clinic and they just estimate how much water to put in there. Never do that. Okay? You guys are better than that. You think you guys can measure the right amount, but our ability to gauge you know how thin or thick this material is is probably pretty poor okay so I know this is true because if we just look at our measurements right our ability to gauge measurements is already not there imagine you know determining thinness or thickness of material so the reason things don't work out generally is because we get lazy and then we try to mix things without measuring properly Okay, so this isn't like baking a cookie where you can, oh, you may mess up, you give it to your wife and they'll still eat it or something, right? This is somebody's mouth that you can do irreparable harm. So measure, just measure stuff, okay? All right, so our type 4, specifically the type that we're using in our um, clinic is Excalibur. It's a type 4 high strength stone. So you just want to put that into uh, this lecture. Um, and the reason I do this is because I feel like it's important for you guys as medical providers, you guys are going to be, one, like changing somebody's, like, their teeth. Like you're doing something irreversible, right? You're physically, like, taking away a part of their body, and then you're going to replace it with some sort of material. So if I were a patient, I'd want my dentist to know everything about anything that goes into my mouth. Right? You're just not going to let a surgeon all of a sudden implant something into your knee. And you ask them, well, what is it? Well, I don't know. Right? So it's important for all these steps that you know kind of the material, especially anything that gets permanently seated into your patient's mouth. You better know what the hell that is. Right? And you better know what the properties are. So whether it's a restoration, direct or indirect, so all the composites and bonding agent, third, fourth, fifth, sixth generation, you better know that stuff. Right? Because when you get down the clinic floor and we go, okay, what type of bonding resin are you going to be using? You don't have an answer. We'll send you home. Okay? You're not going to put something in somebody's mouth that you don't know what you're putting in. So all your Fuji stuff. Remember all your Fuji 2 liners? All that good stuff? God know what that is. Okay? So as you guys prepare to transition the clinic, it's important to go back and kind of review those things. Okay. So type 4 stone. It's not going to go in somebody's mouth, but you got to know it's part of the process. Okay? So vacuum mix, we teach you to put it in that vacuum mixer. And the reason for that, it creates a more dense, stronger stone. You can see the difference on the left. That's not vacuum mix. The one on the right is. You can see the smooth, homogeneous uh, mixture. And that when that sets, guess which one's going to be stronger? The one that's vacuum mix, right? Which one takes more time and effort? The one on the right which is the one that you guys are going to be producing. The one on the right, because you guys are willing to make the time and effort to do the right thing. Okay? Don't learn from the third and fourth years. Wherever they do, do the opposite. Okay? All right, so mounting plaster. Type 1 gypsum is used to mount uh, cast and articulator, so this is something you've used before. Okay, so... Let's talk about investment. Uh, no, 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 that's the wrong slide. Let's skip that. We'll come back to it. Actually, just delete that slide. I don't think I updated that one. So 
put a big X on it. But look at the pictures. Look at the pictures. Okay. So the mounting procedure involves this one first mounting the cast, the actually cast to the articulator. So if you remember the video, I'll pull up the video again uh, later. But we saw that we mounted the actually cast onto the articulator. We're going to get into much more detail about that tomorrow. The middle picture shows us mounting the lower cast and hand articulating it against our maxillary cast. So how do the two jaws fit together? In what relationship should they be positioned against each other? Okay. So that's what we call a jaw relation record, or sometimes we'll refer to it as a bite record. How does a patient bite together? And then the picture on the right is us mounting the lower cast onto our articulator, so by adding the mounting plaster. So ignore all this stuff in the bottom. That's for a different uh, slide that we're going to get into. So we have type 1 stone is our mounting plaster, and our type 4 is our cast. So this is just a diagram that shows what it should end up looking like once we're done. And notice how the maxillary and mandibular casts are positioned in a way that reflects what the patient does in their mouth. So if you were to check the contacts on this cast, you would hope to find that the patient contacts in the same areas, right? So if you went around and checked with the articulating paper and mash, 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 you're going to find dots in places. And if you did the same thing in the patient's mouth, hopefully the dots correspond. That means you've mounted that two casts together accurately. It reflects what the patient does. So the question is, well, how do we, uh, how does the mandibular cast mounted against the maxillary cast? So one of the easiest ways is we just take the two casts and we hand articulate it, meaning we take the two casts and we just put them together. And we're saying that if some, if the patient has a stable MIP, right, maximal intercuspated position, then there should be only one way in which that kind of fits together. So think of a puzzle, and you got all these deep grooves and cuss, and if they all line up, they're just going to lock in and sock in, right? Think about how long you've been using your teeth for, right? So when's the last tooth that's erupted? I don't know any of this stuff anymore. Are you guys having? Oh yeah, you guys did. This is your dental anatomy. Third molars. All right, forget the third molars. Second molars. At twelve, okay. And then how old? We'll pick on you. <laughs> How old are you? I am 27. 27, okay. So 27 minus 12, I'm what's 40, that? 41. 41 minus 12. 41 minus 12 is like 30. Okay. <laughs> 29. So for 30 years, for 29 years, Kimball has been using his teeth in a certain way, and he's been going to the certain end position where all his teeth come together. We call that end position MIP, maximum intercuspal position. If you made casts of his teeth and you put them together, how many different positions would you find that that's still stable? Probably just the one, the very end point, because he's essentially milled in his bite, where it's pretty consistent every single time, right? So for most of the patients that you'll see on this dental clinic, we'll have a pretty stable maximum intercuspid position. The ones that don't, that have a lot of issues, tend to, you know, usually it's more involved and gets referred out. Okay? We'll go over a few scenarios where you can't get a MIP, and we'll show you a few workarounds. Okay? So hand articulation, you guys get that principle? You take two casts, sock them together. If they have a stable MIP, it'll stay right there. Okay? And what you mount on the articulator will match that of what the patient has in the mouth. So this is our mounting, our jaw relation record. So when a patient has a stable MIP, the maxillary mandibular cast will lock into one position. Since the teeth are maximally intercuspated, there will be no rock when the casts are held together. This happens pretty frequently. Okay. So to help us get this position, or to verify that we have it correct, we can use this idea of a bite registration. So the bite registration is going to go between the prep tooth and the opposing tooth. So similar to what, and essentially the same procedure that you did when you measured your lingual cusp production. You squared a little bite reg, right? 
you close the articulator together, and you wait for that to set up. And then you take your calipers and you measure that distance. So with that little piece of registration, you can put that onto the CAS to help you confirm that you have the right mounting. Okay? So when you have a stable MIP, that helps confirm your mounting or it helps facilitate your um, jaw relation. If you happen to lose that registration, well, you can still mount the case, right, if you have a stable MIP. You can still physically put the two casts together. There are certain situations where if you don't have that registration, you're going to find a little rock in your cast. So in this example here, you can see the last three teeth have been ground down. So now you've lost your one leg of a tripod. Think of it that way. So that will help support the uh, cast when you kind of hold them together. Okay. So when, a, when MIP is not achievable, so some examples are flatworm teeth or unable to tripod due to missing teeth or prep teeth, you should probably say as well, a bite registration is required to mount the cast accurately. So we'll get into a specific situation in a few slides. But first, let's talk about this bite reg. So you always want it between the prep tooth and the opposing tooth. You don't want it to leak over on teeth that are in contact with each other. Okay. So we'll talk about that why. Um, but before we get there, we always want to trim our bite record. So this is an example of a bite registration that was made that has not been trimmed. So if you look at the junction between the teeth and the bite reg, you can see a small little gap. Let me jump forward after we've trimmed the record you can see that the maxillary teeth fit into that bite reg much better. And why do you think that is after trimming it? Well, I'll explain that. All right, so this is somebody's teeth that my five-year-old drew. I don't have a five-year-old, but. <laughs> Uh, that's my best PowerPoint lines that I can draw. All right, so that's somebody's teeth, and then you make a bite registration here, right? Following, I need two nodders at least. Okay, bite registration. So that's our bite rate. We can take it out of the mouth. This is similar to what you did to measure your lingual reduction, right? Piece of purple PVS material. Then eventually you're going to make an impression of this arch. So when we turn so this blue represents stone, okay, or stone cast. So we turn from this, somebody's mouth, to stone. Look at the, and I try to accentuate this and kind of make this a little bit more uh, visible, but pay attention to your embrasure spaces and cusp fossas here. So when I go from your actual mouth to your bite register, uh, your stone cast, what happens to the detail of those little nooks and crannies? It doesn't pick up every little detail. So an impression is made of the teeth important to gypsum. Since there is some dimensional change with the impression material in stone, the casts are not a perfect replica of the teeth. So it's in these areas, usually, the embrasure spaces or the um, fossas is where you don't pick up sort of the surface detail of it. So things that came to a sharp point, right, where the embrasures touch, sometimes don't get picked up in that kind of detail. So one more time, and they get, kind of get blunted, all right? But your registration does pick up that pretty well, and it's pretty accurate. So when you go try to seat this bite reg, remember this is made on the actual teeth itself, not on the stone cast, right? And when you try to seat it, what's going to happen? Well, those areas are going to touch first in the embrasure spaces, and you're going to have a gap between the cast and the registration. Well, one solution to get, you know, to rectify this problem is to trim our registration. So we take a lab knife, and then we slice off the areas that we don't need or that would interfere. And most likely, those are our embrasure spaces. And essentially, all we want to do is leave the cuss tips so we slice those off, and now we can seat the registration further. 
Voila. So this is why we trim our byte registration, because the CAS doesn't 100% reflect what the patient has. There's some inaccuracies. The PBS won't sit as accurately until you trim off some of those areas that have a high potential for interference. So you can see a byte record has been trimmed. That is what it should look like. You should just leave the cusp tips so you avoid interference. The other thing we want to notice is look at the canine area. So the canines are not prepared, but some of it had leaked over to a tooth-to-tooth -to -tooth contact. Okay. So what we want to do there is actually cut off that area that captures a tooth-to-tooth -tooth contact. So if you look to the left of that registration, you see two prepped teeth. If you prepare the teeth, guess what? You have space between that prep tooth and the opposing tooth, so you have room for this bite registration. In the canine area, the two canines are touching. That's why you see a little area that's been perforated, right? Because if you, there's two teeth are touching, well, guess what? There's no space for that material to exist, okay? So if you left that and you try to use that area to seat the two canines in that registration, it's not going to fit as well. Okay? So the principle here is it is more accurate to have stone casts, so the canine areas, it's better to have those canines touching stone to stone than to have stone, a thin piece of PVS, and then stone. Okay? So that little area there that you have that thin piece is going to interfere with the two stone casts touching. Because remember, in your mouth, those two teeth are actually touching. Therefore, on your articulator, you want the two stone teeth to touch. Yes? Would the bite reg be what? No, because when you put the bite reg in, it's uh, viscous enough that when you close, it'll push it out of the way. That's why in most of the time when you have that situation, you're going to have an actual hole or perforation there. Okay, yeah. So yes, if you don't time your registration well, let's say you, you know, because it has a certain working time, right? And some registrations are going to have a fast working time, some are going to have a slow. Let's say you put the registration on the tooth and then you, I don't know, check your phone and you wait and oh yeah, you have to close and you exceeded that working time and then they close, then that material may not get out of the way because it already started to set. But if you place that material and then they close down within the working time, that material should get out of the way and not cause the occlusion to be high. Right? Is that what you're trying to get at? Okay. Good question. All right. So we're going to trim it in both directions. One, to avoid tooth-to-tooth -tooth contact. And then two, to uh, just leave the cuss tips. Um, what time is it? You guys need a break? Let's take a break. All right. So let's get in this situation. So primarily we've been working in scenarios that we know we can just hand articulate, meaning we've got a stable maximum intercuspation position. So let's look at this scenario where the patient is missing pretty much all their back teeth. Right? So if you were to try to hand articulate this case, and you know, they have the two most posterior teeth prepped, what do you think is going to happen when you try to sock them in together? There's gonna, it's going to tip. Right? It doesn't have a tripod for it to be stable. Can you guys all visualize this? It won't be stable because there's no back teeth to support it. It's going to have some rock or a tip. So a rock or tipping will exist between two casts when not enough teeth are present to tripodize them. In order to stabilize the two casts together, a record base, so this is a new term for you, needs to be fabricated on the master cast. So when we say master cast, what we mean is the cast in which your final impression is poured out of. To provide a platform for a bite registration to be made intraorally. So 
let me reemphasize, the bite record that you make is made inside the patient's mouth and then is seated onto the master cast, just to be clear. So the bite registration is made intraorally and it's seated on your stone cast. So as we can see that there's not enough, um, or there's not enough teeth here to stabilize this, the two casts together. So when you try to mash them together, it's going to tip. So when you think of all the possibilities of errors, if you don't do anything to help yourself, the space in the posterior, well, you're not really sure how wide or how much space should be there, right? Could it be, does the patient have this space on the left, which is a lot, or does the patient have a little bit of space as shown on the picture on the right? That's a big question mark, right? So the orientation of the jaw relation in which the two casts are mounted against each other, we need to mount that a little bit more accurately than just kind of guessing what that distance should be, because that's going to affect the occlusion of our crown. So the solution to that is to make what we call a record base. So this is made out of a pink triad. So triad you've used before. It's the same material that you use for your custom tray. It's UDMA, urethane dimethacrylate. And instead of clear, it's going to be pink. So the base of that is made off of your master cast. So that fits onto that cast pretty snugly. And on top of that, you're going to add a little bit of wax. So you add wax because you can quickly add or subtract wax when you try this in the patient's mouth. So, so wax and pink triad. So this is fabricated on the cast, but then is taken to the patient's mouth and you put it in the patient's mouth. So what you're trying to get after is once you put the pink or your record base in the patient's mouth, you're going to want a bit of space that exists between the wax and then the opposing tooth. So you generally want about two, three millimeters of space so that you can squirt some bite registration material in between and then have them close together. So again, this is all done in the patient's mouth. Once that material sets, you can take that record base plus the bite registration that you made and put it onto your master cast as depicted in this picture. Then you can put the um, stone cast onto the bite record. So you generally want about a two to three millimeter thickness of material there for some rigidity. Okay, so that's what the two to three millimeters there signifies is that between the wax and then the opposing teeth, you want to leave some space for your bite registration. Question? I know I'm completely ignorant, but why uh -huh. are you using so many different materials? You know, why do you put the wax in there if you're going to have two to three millimeters anyway of register? You know. Okay. Seems... So, because when you first make the record base, you're not how you're not sure how much space you need. So wax is used because you can take, like, heat up a little paddle and then quickly melt that to get your two to three millimeters space. Or you can quickly add wax to bulk it up. So wax is used as just a material that's easy to control the height of it to get your two to three millimeters, and then you can fill that with um, your bite wrench. So the idea is that you're not really sure how tall to make that at first, okay, until you try it in the patient's. So once you've made that record and then you put it, you know, intraorally and then you put it on the master cast, well, guess what? Now you can mount this case accurately onto your articulator so that the space that's between, you can think of, you know, the posterior ridge to the teeth or from your prep tooth to your opposing teeth, that is going to be the same as it looks in the patient's mouth. So a record base helps stabilize or helps us mount cases in which we do not have a stable maximum intercuspation position, meaning that we can't hand articulate those casts together. Okay. Questions about that principle?
All right, that will be on your exam in some form or another in probably multiple questions. So we have two types of bite ridge that we're going to use in our clinic. One is Regisil, which you guys have all used as the purple stuff. And then another is uh, a green material. And then uh, the brand name for that is Take One. And they're both used as bite registration material. They're both fast setting PVS. So remember the impressions that you use to make your um, pre-op impressions, your triple tray impressions? That was a five minute um, setting time. These are much shorter. So let's start with the Regisil. This has a minute and 10 seconds. The downside of this compared to take one is not as rigid. So if you pick up that purple stuff, there's some flexibility to it. Don't confuse this with the medium body PBS when you go make like a final impression. And we see students do this all the time where they think this is the medium body and they start loading it in the tray. And then they quickly run out of time because they had set up ready. Okay. And vice versa. Don't pick up the medium body PBS material and squirt that in between your prep tooth and your opposing tooth because you're going to be sitting there for five minutes waiting for that to set up. Okay, so just because it's purple, think what shade of purple it is. Then we have our take one. So this has a much shorter working time. I don't think I put it on there. It should be 15 seconds. I'll update that. Um, 15 second working time, so much, much quicker, right? So this is easy when you just got one tooth, you just squirt over the tooth, have them close. But if you need to go around the arch, let's say, and you have both areas, then sometimes you need the longer working time and it may not be a great idea to use this material because it'll set up before the patient has an uh, opportunity to close down. So uh, the advantage of this though is that it's a lot more rigid than your um, purple bite registration from Regisil. So the advantage there is there's less flex in the material as you try to mount your stuff together. So the less moving or movement you have in your records, the probably more accurate it is. Okay, so it's just, so you know, you know, sometimes you'll see a purple one, sometimes you'll see a green one. The idea is the same, but it's a little different material, yes. Right, right, right. So in the situation you showed, you know, if you move fast enough, you can get on both sides. But we notice with students sometimes you're not quick enough to inject and have them close. Okay? So cross arch is just both sides. Or bilateral, being that way too. Um, should I show the video or do you guys know what is going on here? Let's play a quick little segment here. So we're going to pick up. So we have our impression poured. Um, well, no, you guys can watch this on your own. You guys know what's going on. Let's go through the steps, though. So once you have your impression poured, we're going to uh, section. You know, we do our pindexing of it. And that allows us to remove the dye individually so that we can trim the dye. So the importance of trimming the dye is that you want a clear junction between the tooth and where the crown is going to be, or where the wax, you know, it's going to go through different stages, but you're going to wax up onto this. So that's why tissue retraction is so key here, because you want a clearly defined junction. So imagine if you had an equigingival preparation that you didn't use retraction cord. So the margin is at the same level as the gingiva. Then you make an impression of that and pour it up. Well, when you have it in the stone, are you going to be able to tell where that margin is? In the mouth, it's easy because you can see pink and white, and you know that's where my tooth is, that's where my margin is. When you pour it into stone, there's no pink and white stone, right? Everything looks the same. So you're going to have a hard time delineating where that margin is. So that's why tissue retraction is so key in these areas, especially or specifically for equa and subgingival cases. When you're supergingival, of course, you should be able to easily tell the difference between your margin and your tissue. So you're going to trim all that stuff away. And then, so you can see an example of that, how it's nicely trimmed. And that should follow more or less the root form of that tooth. 
And you need to trim that away because as you're waxing up your crown, guess what? Your instrument needs to fit along that margin to kind of carve away the excess wax. So you need to create a little room there for you to be able to do your wax up procedure. So marking the margin with a red pencil just helps identify where the margin is so that when you start to layer wax on it, you can see the red line through the thin piece of wax. So it's just a visual tool to mark the margin. And this part's important because a clean, well-defined margin is going to be easy to wax to. And you can verify your seating much easier when it's a nice, crisp line. So some of our preps, we have these little jaggedness to it. Or we have a drop. You know, Your margin will be at one height, and all of a sudden it'll drop straight down, and it'll be at a different height. So those little discrepancies, we want to smooth out and just keep it one continuous margin circumferentially. And then J margins are going to be no good, too. So if you take that chamfer burr and you sink it in axially too much, you're going to have that little lip because the burr has that curvature to it. So then we put on a little die spacer. So the purpose of the die spacer is to create room for cement. We've gone over this. If you don't have this or your die spacer is not enough, what's going to happen to your crown when you seat it in the mouth? It's not going to seat down fully, so you're probably going to have an open margin, and your occlusion is going to be hyper. So in that clinical scenario, the solution, unfortunately, is you're going to have to cut off the crown and then redo it. There's not much chance, once you've got it cemented, to get it off, unless you recognize it right away and then pull it right off before the cement sets. So there's a couple factors that may alter your decision on how much die spacer to make or to put on. So the taper, if you have something that has, let's say, half a degree of taper, so almost parallel, you're probably going to want a little bit more room for cement. Because when your walls are that parallel to each other, it's hard for the cement to escape out of those walls. Whereas if you have something that leans in quite a bit, as you seat it, you got plenty of room for that cement to escape. So sometimes if your taper is really parallel, it's advantageous to put a thicker layer of die spacer there for room for cement to escape. Similarly, depending on the type of cement you use, so cements, and we'll get into this in a different lecture, but the important thing to know for um, the next few days for the quiz and exam is that some cements are going to be have what they call a thicker film thickness. So film thickness is if you took cement and let's say you put it between two glass slabs, right? And you just push the two glass slabs together. How thin can you get that cement to be? So the standard is, is zinc phosphate. That's about 25 microns of film thickness. Some of the other types of cement that we'll use, as an example, a resin cement is going to have a much thicker film thickness, meaning you can't compress that cement to a really, really thin layer. It's going to be thicker than other types of cement. Okay, So the thicker the film thickness of the cement, you may want a larger amount of die spacer. Because again, the die spacer is it makes room for the cement. So those are the two principles. Taper and type of cement are two things that may influence the ideal amount of dye space that you put onto the preparation. So once you got that all set up, you're going to add some um, lubrication to the dye so that you can add wax and be able to take off the wax once you're done with the wax contour. So tomorrow we'll talk about the articulator and mandibular movements and things that are going to affect the contour of our wax up. But the principle is you add wax until it looks like a tooth. So if it's a full, uh, full metal crown, you're going to wax it up to its full contour. If you're going to do a porcelain fused metal crown, you're going to have to do a cutback. And the cutback is you remove some wax so you create room for porcelain. So the uh, wax up for a PFM isn't going to look like a tooth, 
it's going to look like a little thimble, or it's going to be a shell of a tooth. Right? We'll call that a metal coping that you're going to add porcelain to. So full contour versus a metal coping. So if you've got a good path of draw, you're going to be able to take the wax off. Okay, so stuff you've seen before. Here's a part, um, and maybe I'll play this part here when we talk about investing and sprueing. So this is mounting. We put the die spacer. We wax it up. This is our wax up. So this red stuff is wax. And then this is going on what we call a crucible former. Remember, we'll have a ring that goes around it. So this is what we'll call a runner bar. And then our sprue attaches to our crown. And this is our crucible former. And inside here, we're going to pour what type of material? An investment material. And we're going to go over the three types that we have. So that gets mixed up. It's vacuum mixed. And that will be poured into the crucible former. And we want to make sure that the investment material completely captures all the detail of our crown. So we take a finer instrument to make sure that there's no voids, and then we can later fill in the rest of that. So that is our wax pattern that will get burned out when we place it in the furnace. We'll let that material set up. So that's investment material with wax inside, and all that disappears as you heat it. And then you're going to sling all this metal into that opening. That's going to fill that cavity with metal. Break it out. And then recover your casting. OK? Um, so let's quickly go over what we have to know about that process. So this is what we call the sprue. And again, this is our crucible. So the sprue must allow the molten wax to escape from the mold, and it must enable the molten metal to flow into the mold with little, uh, as little turbulence as possible. The sprue should be attached to the bulkiest non-critical part of the pattern, normally the largest non-functional cusp. It is used, um, uh, is used at a minimum of 6 millimeters from the top. So the key points here. You want to place this so it's not at the very top. You want at least six millimeters of space. The sprue should attach to the bulkiest area, to the non uh, to the bulkiest non-critical part of the pattern. So generally, for a gold crown, this is going to be our non-functional cusp. So underline that sentence. So let's think about as you know the metal gets slung into this space, right? Sometimes you'll see um, this, what we call a runner bar. You can think of this as a reservoir of metal that the material is going to flow into from. So this whole thing gets spun. And you can imagine the path that the metal is going to take as it casts. Um, if you think about the ends of the casting, Right? The metal is going to come through here, it's going to move here, and then it's going to hit the margin. That's the furthest area from that reservoir. The key here is that you want the, uh, well, let's back it up. As the metal flows through here and it touches the wall of the investment, that's the area that's going to cool first. So as things cool, things are going to shrink. Right? So if you look at the kind of a time lapse of it, things are here are going to cool first, then it'll cool here, then it'll cool here, cool here, cool here. And finally, the last year that's going to cool is the reservoir of metal. So you want to maintain a reservoir of molten metal away from your casting. 
because you want all this to solidify first, and by the time you get here, this is the part that solidifies last. So the area that solidifies last is going to contain what we call some sort of suckback porosity. Okay? All castings contain porosity in the area that solidifies last. Therefore, correct placement of the wax pattern will ensure that porosity will exist in the reservoir and not in the crown. So if you placed your wax pattern or your crown in an area that is not, um, let's say you mixed up or you place it in an incorrect position where all of a sudden the area that cools first is this reservoir, well, you're not going to have enough molten wax to flow into your casting, okay? Um, so the point is you always want a pool of molten metal to fling or sling into your casting. Um, so that's sort of the principle. Now, again, you guys are going to do very little, almost no casting um, in your dental careers, but I think the... One, they're going to test you on the boards, so we'll give it to you there. Um, but sometimes when you're troubleshooting with the lab and you're consistently getting castings that don't fit, it's important to know some of these procedures so that you can help your lab tech troubleshoot some potential problems. Okay? Um, so the idea is that the main principle is you want a pool of molten metal that stays warm so that you have a reservoir of metal that can fill your casting so all this stuff cools first, and then this part cools last. You don't want it reversed, where this cools uh, last, and then this cools first. So if that happens, if your casting ends up cooling um, last, you're going to have what we call a suckback porosity. So you're going to have a little void here, whereas the picture on the right is a picture that is an appropriately casted coping. So we're going to talk about investment material, and we'll kind of wrap it up here. There's three types of um, investment material that we're going to classify uh, it by. Uh, sorry, there's three types of investment material, and they're classified by its binder. So let's see if I have an explanation of this. OK, so an investment material must fulfill three important requirements. It must reproduce precisely the detail of the wax pattern. It must provide sufficient strength to withstand the heat of the burnout, and it must expand sufficiently to compensate for the solidification shrinkage of the alloy. So there's two things that make up this investment, a binder and the refractory material. So each serves um, its purpose. So these are important to note. So the binder provides rigidity to the investment material, and the refractory the purpose of the refractory material is to regulate the thermal expansion of the investment. Because remember, we're going to put this through differing temperatures. Okay? So the binder, there's three types of binders that we're going to talk about. Gypsum, phosphate, or ethyl silicate. And for refractory, there's generally just one type of refractory that you're going to find in any type of investment material, and that's silica. Okay. So when we talk about investment materials, they're going to be classified by what binder is present. But they're all going to have silica in it. So again, binder, refractory material. Those are the two things contained in it. Let's talk about the classification of these investment materials based on binders. So you have three types, gypsum-based investment material, phosphate-based, and ethyl silicate. So let's focus on gypsum and phosphate. These are used for casting of crowns and bridges. <clears throat> Prior to gold being very expensive, we were using a lot of gypsum-based investment material because it gives us the best surface detail, but it was limited to the heat in which it can withstand. So gypsum-based material represents the type traditionally used for the conventional casting of gold alloys um, inlays, onlays, crowns, and FPDs, which are bridges. But it's limited to high gold containing alloys with melting ranges below 1,000 degrees Celsius. Okay. 
So that's the melting range of the metal to be used. What I have written above the below 650 degrees centigrade is the temperature that the uh, investment material should be placed in, in terms of the oven, the oven temperature. Okay, so it's two different things, right? The temperature that you set your oven in, that you put the investment material in, and then the temperature that the metal needs to be uh, raised to in order for it to be melted. Um, so we almost never use gypsum-based investment material because we hardly use any um, metals that contain such a high amount of gold anymore. And the reason for that is just the cost of gold has gotten so expensive over the years. So in turn, what they developed was a phosphate-bonded investment material. So this allows for higher temperatures. So the alloys that we're using nowadays melt at a much higher temperature. Therefore, we needed to switch to an investment material that can withstand a higher temperature. So when you place this into the oven, it's going to go in at above 650 degrees centigrade. And then the alloys that we use are going to have a melting temperature much higher than your traditional gold alloys, or high containing gold alloys. Okay? Uh, the disadvantage is it doesn't um, capture as much of the detail as well. But still, very good uh, in terms, or, you know, still acceptable for our needs. Okay? So that would be the one disadvantage compared to a gypsum-based investment material. The last type of investment that we're going to talk about is an ethyl silicate. And the thing you just got to know about this is that this investment material is used for our removable partial dentures, RPDs. And the metals that we use for RPD are a um, high-fusing base metal alloy. So I think that's all I want you to know about the ethyl silicate is it's used for RPDs and it's used for high fusing base metal alloys. Okay, so the investment material used at our school is a phosphate bonded material. Specifically, it's a GC Fuji Vest 2. So that's all I want to say about investment material. Let's finish up with metals so we can get you in the sim clinic. Um, from our dental materials class, we, knew, we know we have metals that are classified into three different categories. High noble, noble, predominantly base metal, or base metal is another uh, word that we'll say. And the categories um, is based on the amount of noble metal content and also gold content. So in order to figure out what category your metal is, well, you look at all the lists or you look at the list of your alloy in terms of its composition, and then you pull out your, um, or you first look for the gold content. So if it's a high noble metal, it's going to fulfill two requirements. One, 40% of the weight of your alloy is going to be gold, and then if you add up all the noble metals, which are listed in the parentheses there, the weight of that is going to exceed 60% of the composition. So it's got to fulfill those two requirements. Okay? So remember, gold is a noble metal, so that's going to be included in your 60% calculation. So if it fulfills that requirement, it's a high noble metal. If it doesn't, then the next question is, well, does it at least contain 25% or more by weight of these noble metals. If it does, then we'll consider it a just a regular noble metal, not a high noble. And lastly, if it contains less than 25% of noble metals in its composition, then we're going to call that a base metal. So these are this is a table of um, different types of metal alloys that are typically seen, and it's just a reference for you to see how um, different companies will formulate different percentages of their noble alloys or their metals. So the um, element listed first is generally going to be the highest containing element in the alloy and then each subsequent material is going to be of lesser containing. So the highest, you know, the top ones are mostly gold, so that's listed first. Then you have silver for that first example, and then copper is contained in the other two. 
So that's just for your reference. And again, just another chart to give you an idea that there's differing metals used in differing compositions as you go from high noble to your predominantly base metal. So you notice your base metals, there is no metal, noble metal content in those. Those are typically nickel, chromium, or cobalt. Um, so those are classic metals seen in a base metal composition. Okay? So let's talk about uh, metals. There's five things or five physical properties that I want you to know if you were to compare metals with a high noble content versus those with a low noble content. So unfortunately, these are things that you just kind of have to memorize. So high noble um, content metals, um, their melting temperatures, so the higher the noble content will result in the following properties when compared to a base metal alloy. So let's start with um, melting temperature. Hold on, this is not right. Um, the higher the noble content, you're going to have a lower melting temperature, whereas your base metal alloys need to be melted at a higher temperature. So cross that out. Shrinkage on cooling. A high noble content metal has less shrinkage than a base metal. Castability, and we'll get into that term. A high noble metal casts better than a base metal. A high noble alloy um, has, is not as hard as a base metal alloy. So the hardness is decreased. Okay? And then corrosion. The high noble alloy corrodes less, so it's more resistance to corrosion than a base metal alloy. So, yeah, there's nothing to do but to memorize these things. Um, I don't know how else to teach this, but, okay. So there's two types of metals that we'll use. One is going to, or sorry, there's two categories. One is going to be a metal ceramic alloy. So when you think about our PFMs, remember we start with a coping, that stack that we stack porcelain on. And one is going to be called Argibon 80. The other is going to be called Argident Euro. So let's go through this exercise. Why don't you go on Google, and somebody, or you guys Google Argibon 80, and then Google Argident Euro, and then figure out which is a high noble metal and which is a noble metal. Because that's something we'll have on the quiz or exam is we'll give you a list of metals in their composition, and then you're going to have to determine whether it is a high noble metal versus a noble metal. So let's take a few minutes just so you can go through this exercise. Okay. Okay, and how did you arrive at that conclusion? What did you know, what did you find about about the euro that made you think it was a high noble? How much? Okay. Right, so those, so platinum and gold are noble metals. So if you add those two numbers up, you get 70% of noble metal content. And it also fulfills the 40% requirement for gold specifically, right? So arginine euro, we're going to label as a high noble metal. And then if you looked at the composition for Argibond 80, you're going to realize that that's a noble metal. Okay, so again, just the idea that whenever you put something in somebody's mouth, you're going to want to know what type of metal you're putting in and the advantages and disadvantages of them. So think about all the advantages of using a high noble metal is that, well, it corrodes less, so we obviously don't want things that corrode in somebody's mouth, right? The castability is better, and we'll talk about that, how it adapts to the tooth, okay? Uh, the disadvantage, though, of the high noble metal is what? It's pretty damn expensive, okay? So some people will start to cut costs because the lab bill that they get, um, starts to get high, and the price of gold obviously fluctuates over the years. Um, 
So then we have two different types that we're going to use for our full metal crowns, meaning no cutback, no porcelain. And that's Arjenko 56 and Arjenko Y+. Plus. So again, one's a high noble metal, the other is a noble metal. So you're going to need to know how to differentiate between those two if we gave you the list of um, its composition. Okay? All right. Let's uh, talk about castability. So we know that a high noble metal casts better. So the idea here is that you want the casting to be really snugly fit onto the die, which will then in turn be snugly fit onto your preparation or your tooth. So high noble metals are going to fill, if you want to think about it this way, like this casting pattern a lot better than a base metal. So if you look at the picture on the right, you see how there's, it doesn't fill into those little nooks and crannies as well, which means if you use a base metal as your alloy, it's going to have a looser fit some of the times on your preparation. Okay, So a high noble metal is going to fit or adapt to the tooth better than a base metal because of this idea of castability. Another word that you'll hear us use is how well adapted or adaptability of that crown onto the tooth preparation. Okay, So if you want a tighter fitting or a snugger fit on your um, crown, you're going to want to use a high noble metal. So what's the importance of having a snugger fit? Well, the tighter that that crown fits on the tooth, the less you are reliant on the cements to keep that tooth in place. So if you have a looser fit, you're relying more on the cement. So if you're relying more on the cement, well, eventually that cement may wash out. Right? Over time, every time you chew on that tooth, you're going to have some movement and some movement. And it's also an oral environment, which means the cement may have some sort of dissolution. So if that cement seal breaks, then you have the chance that bacteria runs underneath or you just lose a seal and the crown will come off. So the better adapted your crown is to the tooth, the less reliant it is on the cement to help hold it in. Thus, in theory, you're going to have a crown that's going to last a little bit longer. Okay. So studies show the alloys of the higher noble content fare better in castability compared to base metal alloys. The advantage of the base metal is their low cost. And then um, we talked about hardness or rigidity. So we know that the advantage of the base metals is that they're harder or more rigid. Okay. So there is some advantage in using that base metal. Um, noble metals are superior to base metals when it comes to biocompatibility. So I threw this chart on, just comparing noble metals to base metals. Um, and they are uh, not as technique sensitive when putting on layering or porcelain. And also the casting process is a little bit easier. So the things to note is just basically these three points. Noble metals are superior to base metals when it comes to biocompatibility the technique sensitivity of the casting procedure, and its bonding to porcelain. And the advantage of the base metals is that they're low cost and the rigidity and the long span bridges, which we will talk about in the second half of our course. All right, let's finish up real quick. Just want to give you an outline of the actual materials we use at the school. We use an aquacil, so you've seen some of this, where we have the medium body plus the light body. The working time, you have a minute, 10 seconds. Um, for you to insert it in the mouth, five minutes to seat it. Our mounting, uh, our die stone is this type four, Excalibur. Our mounting plaster, this white stuff, is a type one. We're using a phosphate bonded Fuji Vest two, and then we're going to use. Um, you have your metal ceramic crowns or PFM crowns. One is noble, the other is high noble, and then same for full metal. We're going to have two types that we use in our clinic care. Um, viscosities, you have different viscosity of PVS. Gypsums, we know they're classified by strength. The investment material, they're classified by binders, the different binders, but they all contain the same refractory material, which is quartz. Again, this regulates thermal expansion. This provides rigidity to the material. And then 
or metal is classified by its nobility, so high based on noble content, high, noble, and base. Um, that concludes the lecture. Before we get going, um,